At the start of testing in Bahrain, Mercedes has showed us a side pod leading edge geometry that is very different to anything we've seen on any car so far. In this video, we're going to talk through the legalities of this design and how it can actually exist, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the aerodynamics of what they are doing with this design feature. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19, and 20 Formula One seasons, and now I work as an aerodynamics consultant designing aerodynamic packages for race cars in all different classes all around the world. Now, a lot of people are going out there and calling this a B car. I just want to say that this is not a B car. What we're seeing here is we're seeing a different side pod geometry at the front. We're seeing various aero tweaks around the car, but we're fundamentally talking the same sort of mechanicals for the car and a lot of aero features that are just evolutions of what we had before. This is by no means a B car. Now there's a lot of people that are also calling these zero pods. I also don't think that's really accurate either because basically from the driver's head backwards, it's more or less the same design they were running in the previous test. And then it's just the geometry forwards that's changed. And if you have a look at the, the area of this particular side pod inlet and you were to compare that to the, the previous area, we basically transitioned from a, a side pod inlet that was high and wide uh, to one that is tall, but fairly narrow. And I think that if you actually were able to measure and compute the inlet area of these different side pod designs, you wouldn't see a huge difference in inlet size. So with that out of the way, let's get into the legality of the design. Okay, so to start with, what have Mercedes actually done with their side pod? Well, you can see that what we've got here is we've moved the inlet down to lower down, whereas normally under conventional circumstances, it sits much higher up around here. And then what they've done is they've gone and wrapped their side impact structure in a manner such that they can put a giant downwashing winglet along there. Further down, the bodywork flares out into the floor quite wide there for pulling back into a conventional coke line from this point rearwards. There's also some supporting geometries to go along with these changes. We've got a very different mirror stay layout that we're going to discuss as well. And we've also got some chassis canards just in front of the inlet. Now, obviously other teams aren't running this solution on the grid. And also it was never really in the intent of these rules to have giant wings and a bunch of winglets hanging off the car. So how is Merck getting around the legality? And we're going to start with the wing mirror first. Now, as far as the outer portion of the mirror area, Mercedes seems to be using the same method as Alpha Tauri to have a whole bunch of discrete secondary stays. These are using the mirror rear stay legality. This states that the stay may be connected to the side pod with the stay, it's optional, and it has to fit within the width of the mirror body when viewed from the front. There's also rules on how far rearwards it can go and its maximum size in any plane. However, there were no rules on it regarding the maximum number of sections in any plane, so having multiple winglets in this area, like Alpha Tauri, is totally fine. The controversy around this particular mirror stay layout is in fact the inboard stay here, because it doesn't connect to the bodywork over there, like you would see on all the other cars. Now, the rules for the inner stay state that it must connect the mid chassis area over here to the wing body there and it has to lie inboard of the mirror body. So you can see that this particular stay that kinks down must be the inboard stay. It can't be the rearward stay because it is on the inboard side of the mirror body. There's also a few restrictions as to the box that it has to sit in. The key one being that it must be above Z550, which is actually pretty low. It's down here somewhere. Now the real kicker here is, is that you actually get to fully define the mirror stay geometry prior to trimming it to the mid chassis and the side pod. So what I can actually do is I can define my mirror stay to follow a geometry that goes down and across basically in my winglet there and then connects to the body over here. So basically our stay goes down and across through there like that. And then after I've defined this stay, I can then trim it to the side pod. Now we'll go into this later, but Mercedes is essentially declaring this wing as part of its side pod. So when I trim that mirror stay into the side pod, I can then basically end it in real life at this particular point here. So I believe this is how Mercedes is justifying not having to have their mirror stay go the whole way inboard to the side pod. And in doing it this way, it allows them to have more of an end plated vertical vein here and they perhaps didn't want 
a downwashing horizontal vein across that portion there. Now onto the legality of their side pod. Now, Again, Mercedes has been very clever in their interpretation of the rules here, and this has allowed them to create a unique geometry compared to everyone else on the grid. It seems that all the action is happening in this forward portion from here forwards, and this, as far as I can tell, is exclusively in the side pod volume. Now, bodywork within this volume is declared as side pod, and it basically can have as sharp a convex radius as you like, but there are some rules around the concavity of this area. The main rules, though, are how many sections you can have in a certain plane. So you can only have two sections if you slice in an X plane. If you slice looking down from the front of the car, that's the next plane, so only two sections. You look from the side of the car, you can only have two sections. And if you look from the top of the car, you can only have one section. And this is where it starts to get interesting for the Mercedes design. And to illustrate how it's working, I've made a little bit of a 3D model for you. This is a crude model of a side pod. If you can imagine that there's a chassis of a car sitting here, so then you'd have your halo up there like that, driver's head somewhere around here. You've got the, the bodywork coming in there like that. You get the idea. Now what I want to show you is what happens when we take our various sections on this geometry. If we take a section in Y like this, you can see I have two sections here in the side pod, one on the top, one on the bottom, and then they eventually come down into one there. If I take a section in X on this side pod, I only have one section here. And if I take a section in Z, I only have one section going along there. Now what I've done is I've gone and put the Merck downwashing wing with a conventional side pod down the bottom. Now what you'll see is if I go through and do my same inspection, in a Y plane, we have three sections now. You can see we've got one for the wing, two for the side pod. That's no good. However, in an X section, it's fairly easy for us to keep it as two sections the whole way along. You can see I've managed a bit of an overlap by putting a little slot in the back of it, more on that later. So you can see we're good in X, we're not good in Y, we would be good in Z because I've put this winglet above the side pod in its entirety. So how do we get around this issue? We want to keep that geometry? Well, we essentially make it so that our bodywork always flares out until it meets the floor. So if you imagine that our floor is going on as a floor surface out here, this bodywork is always flaring out. And this means that as we start to slice our Y planes, you'll see that we only get two sections in each. We never have the bottom portion of the side pod coming back in there, so we never have three sections. So watch this. I'm coming out in my Y section now, and you can see that I only ever have two sections in Y because the side pod is always going out even as it goes down until it meets the floor. So there's a maximum of two sections in Y. So this side pod is compliant, and this is why Mercedes has to run that side pod geometry where the bottom is always going to be wider than the top. So it looks a little bit like a melted candle. Now, the one final thing I want to talk about in this geometry is the little notch that I've cut in the back of my winglet. Now, it's a requirement by the rules that the sections that you cut when you slice in Y are open. Uh, we obviously can't see below the Mercedes at this point, but I would imagine that they've got something like a couple of millimeter slot in the trailing edge of the wing, and this would make the section of the bodywork open. It wouldn't be too hard to legalize this particular geometry. That's probably how they're doing it. The final bit of legality fun is the rearwards trailing edge. You'll notice that it's quite fat there. Now the rules allow you to have a 50 millimeter sphere that you don't need to obey the concavity rules that are applied to the rest of the bodywork in this region. So I would hazard a guess they're defining their 50 millimeter sphere on the inboard side, and they're using that to transition all this bodywork back together so they have continuity. Now, I think that a lot of this rearwards portion in terms of the really thick trailing edge just there must be to do with legality because generally speaking as aerodynamicists, you don't want thick trailing edges and certainly not that thick. So I imagine they're having to, to cut this and truncate it such that it works with their sectional rules so that when they take their sections, they get everything right, all the continuities right, basically making sure that they're all good and legal. And this is what they are most likely doing with that particular section. Basically, it's a very clever implementation and use of the rules to allow them to put a downwashing winglet where the rules never really intended it to be. With legality out of the way, let's talk about the possible aerodynamic intents of this device. As usual, this analysis comes with the standard disclaimer that I haven't seen wind tunnel or CFD data for this car and flow fields on Formula One cars are complex. So everything I say is an educated guess based on my past experience and understanding of aerodynamics. Now, 
with downwashing winglets in this region, it's something that we've seen on previous years' cars. Uh, pretty much every car on the grid ran a downwashing winglet here in some form or another. And then even this year, we've seen lots of people trying to maximize downwash in this particular region with their bodywork. This is just a more extreme implementation. So what Mercedes could be trying to do with this layout is they're trying to get some pressure in here because downwash should increase the pressure in that particular region there. And that will help manage the, the front wheel weight and push it outboard. You also get more downwash onto the floor leading edge as you pressurize this region. That will improve suction. It will also help with suppressing any separations and losses off the top surface of the floor. Going into a free wing on this geometry though does have a more pronounced benefit than just using your bodywork because they've been able to create a really downwashing surface that looks quite powered up and quite powerful. So what they'll be able to do off this free tip is shed quite a decent vortex off that edge there. And this can have some benefits for managing the flow further downstream. That vortex is going to drive downwash and outwash along the bodywork. So we're going to kick a little bit more outwash in this region, which perhaps explains why they've upgraded their curl a little bit to a little bit more kick, get a bit more extraction out with the extra outwash they've got. That also ties in quite nicely with the blended side pod they've got here, where they've blended that into the floor quite smoothly where it's come down. So having that rotation should help drive downwash along there, which will be converted into outwash. Higher up, that rotation should drive any remnants of wake that are sitting around downstream a little bit further out. And if the forward vein on top of the tile is doing a good job of kicking that upper wake outboard and keeping a fairly clean flow off the top inboard of the tire, you might be able to rotate some of that down onto the bodywork and that might help with your flows further rearwards. Going further rearwards, if that vortex is spinning along out here, we will continue to drive mass flow in a general bulk rotation further rearwards and that may be powering up the edge of the floor even further rearwards a little bit. So if they can power that up a little bit more, they'll get a bit more suction off their edge vortices. Overall, we should see a floor and suction improvement. Now let's talk about how the mirror stays are feeding into this. Basically with the mirror stays, we've got this outwashing cascade on top of the wing. So that's gonna be kicking air out and that actually means that they're gonna cast vortices off them that are rotating in the same direction as the outer tip. What we should be seeing as effects of this is we should have a little bit more pressure on the outside of these, which might help back off the vortices that are coming off this particular winglet, which they may be a little bit on the powerful side. It's quite a, an aggressive downwash with a fairly short aspect ratio. So that might be quite a strong vortex. It might be beneficial to reduce the strength of the actual tip vortices and bias a little bit more of that strength onto the mirror stay vortices. Overall, these vortices by adding more outwash should be adding somewhat of an end plating effect and we should see an overall increase in the strength of the system. It's just discretized a bit more, which may make it a little bit more persistent and stronger further downstream. The other effect we might be seeing from this is that by having these outwashing in that direction, we should impart a slightly more outbound trajectory to the vortices that are coming off here. So if we have vortices coming off here, this should help direct them a little bit further outboards. I mean, they should be downwashing a little bit as they go. And this might go and direct them more onto the face of the tire rather than having them get sucked in into this whole beam wing, rear wing area further downstream. That may be beneficial uh, in terms of performance of the rear wing box. So that's some potential benefits of what they are running here. But let's talk a little bit about the drawbacks because every design is a compromise. Now, running the inlet lower and closer to the floor generally speaking, it's something that hasn't been done for quite a while. And one of the reasons for this is that it's very hard to get a good clean feed of airflow from further upstream. Now on the previous generation's cars with the barge boards and the vortices that were shed off the top edges of those, it was particularly difficult to get particularly clean flow low down. With these cars, it's somewhat less of an issue, but Mercedes has still had to make some compromises despite the fact that their airflow coming along their center line is probably pretty clean. Of course, this floor section is quite downwashing any sort of losses that are coming off the floor section through there could potentially be ingested into the inlet. That would mean worse cooling and worse performance. So they've done some things to try and counter this scenario. If you have a look, we've got these two downwashing chassis canards here. Now these will probably have two functions. They'll increase the downwash and pressurization in this region here, which will probably clean up the losses on top of the floor. They'll also shed some vorticity off the back of them and the vorticity shed by these should help actually clean up any of the chassis losses that are coming along here. So 
Obviously, we start to build up a bit of a boundary layer and some losses as we move along the chassis. Those can get fairly thick as we move further rearwards. These little canards and the vortices that they produce can help suppress these losses. And they need to maximize this because if you actually look at how tall their inlet is there, it means that they have much more of the chassis boundary layer being ingested into their inlet than a conventional car. So from that perspective, they have to go and maximize the cleanliness of the flow right along the wall of the chassis. Now these vortices are of course a compromise because any vortex off there will potentially be fed into the inlet itself. Uh, some of these could be kicked to the outside, but they're pretty close to the wall of the chassis. So I would assume that they're gonna get ingested. But Mercedes has obviously found that that particular compromise is better for overall flow energy entering the inlet than having a large amount of chassis loss further up. And some of this will also change the compromises they have to make around the barge board area compared to other teams, where you can see that they've added this new vein on the outermost strake, but they haven't added any on the innermost strake. And I would hazard a guess they're gonna try and keep this whole area as clean as possible, and it looks like they're trying to keep that portion of the floor as flat as possible to try and make sure that that inlet gets as clean an air as it can from the top surface of the floor. And that's the potential explanation for how these Mercedes side pods are working. That's all for this analysis. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see from me next, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.